Hi, I'm Frank Peacock. I'm an emergency physician and cardiologist, chief medical officer for a septoscope. I'm going to talk about the dirty stethoscopes that are killing my patients. This has been research that I've been engaged in for the last five years or so. It seems pretty obvious when you talk about it, really not so obvious when you uh, talk to physicians about it or nurses or anybody else. These are my disclosures. Um, I do a lot of research. I have a lot of companies that I have been funded with. Healthcare associated infections, we all know this. It's uh, something that happens every day. And if you put it into terms that would be uh, more sensate. The mortality rate is equivalent of a major jet airliner crashing every day with zero survivors. It's estimated we spend almost 150 billion on the indirect and direct costs of what is essentially a preventable event. Um, and if it were planes, we'd have a horrible feeling about it, but since it seems to be a function of hygiene, we'd sort of ignore it. So everybody knows we wash our hands. This has been the primary thing that we've been doing for well, since 150 years ago, since Ignat Simois described the fact that unwashed hands are associated with dead patients. But nobody really washes their stethoscopes, and which is really phenomenal when you consider that the stethoscopes and the hands are very similar. This is me. This is my hospital policy. I'm going to see a patient who has cystic fibrosis. I'm required to wear gowns and gloves and masks. And my stethoscope, you can see it right there, just hanging out there with no protection at all to go touch the patient and then maybe the next one. This is what I wear in uh, COVID era, but my stethoscope is still hanging out there. It's pretty amazing. This is a trial where they cultured the hands and the stethoscope to see what was on there. And you can see the fingertips have a lot of bugs, 467 total aerobic colony counts. But the stethoscope has 90, which is more than the thenar or the hypothenar eminence of the hand. And the, in red is MRSA. So the fingertips and the stethoscope's diaphragm have lots of bugs. And what's amazing is they're the identical bugs. So we wash our hands, and then we smear the same bugs we just took off our hands on our patient with the stethoscope. So it's really a challenge. We should be uh, addressing the fact that the stethoscope is the third hand of a doctor. I got this from the American Board of Emergency Medicine just a few weeks ago. It was a note saying, thank you for taking good care of our patients during COVID. And that was really nice. I mean, the emergency medicine community has taken a beating uh, with COVID with the front line and it's been pretty rough. Uh, but if you look through there, you can see a number of people wearing stethoscopes and not one of them is protected. They all got gloves and masks and face shields and gowns and everything, but that's good for protecting the doctor, not so good for protecting the patient with that stethoscope. You can see right there, that young lady. So if the bugs are identical and proficient, and probably and prolific on the stethoscope, why does the hand have a glove and the stethoscope doesn't? I mean, why wouldn't we do something about that? Yes, you can wash your stethoscopes just like you wash your hands. The problem is the data on that is it doesn't work very well. And the, it takes about two thirds of the bugs off, but leaves a third. And the other problem is nobody really washes their stethoscope. Uh, everybody will claim that they do. So I got a fellow and I had gave him a clipboard. And I said, you follow the doctors and nurses around. And you tell me how many of them actually wash their stethoscope consistent with the CDC guidelines. And the CDC guidelines say is that you clean them, your stethoscope with an isopropyl alcohol pad for 60 seconds. So imagine that. We looked at 400 patients. That's that article up on there on the left and found out that exactly 4% clean their stethoscope, which means 96% doesn't. That's pretty astounding. When you do survey studies, you'll find out about a third of the doctors and nurses say they clean their stethoscope, but that's not what we found when we watched them. And the other, you could also just say I have a dirty hospital, but the reality is, is this was repeated almost identically at the University of California, San Diego, and got almost the identical results. Only 10% of people clean their stethoscope, 90% did not. And we're talking about between every patient, but wouldn't you wash your hands between every patient? So we have the same bugs off, just took off our hands and now we're smearing them on our patients. It doesn't even make sense. Why hasn't there been a solution? It's pretty amazing. Well, this is one of the problems. Every time I talk about this, people go, well, where's the randomized controlled trial that shows the stethoscope spread disease? And like I said, I do a lot of research. I have research associates who go in the, and they'll consent the patient and enroll them in a trial. And imagine this young lady goes up to one of my patients that says, Excuse me, sir, 
We're doing a study to determine if stethoscopes can transfer pathogens. Would you please sign this consent form where we're going to rub some pathogens on you with a stethoscope and see if they make you sick? And what patient would ever say yes to that study? That'd be absurd. So we're never going to have a prospective randomized controlled trial where we smell bugs on people with stethoscopes. But we do have other trials, surrogates, that we can uh, think about. This is a study, Thacker took cauliflower mosaic, mosaic viral DNA, it's a non-pathogen for humans, and put them uh, on 31 patients, and then went in there and had somebody examine them with a stethoscope, and then go to the next room and listen to the next patient. And 28% of the time, the cauliflower mosaic viral DNA ended up on the second patient. Do the math on that, that's one in three patients got the disease from the patient next door that they didn't have otherwise. So the stethoscope is the second most contaminant of spreading bugs between patients after the hands. Why don't we clean it? Why don't we do something about that? Part of that is the CDC's position on it has been not very strong. I'll talk about that more in a few minutes. This is another study where they used mannequins, um, 30 volunteers, three simulation mannequins, same uh, cauliflower mosaic virus DNA, but they also use bacteriophage and non-toxic C. diff spores and fluorescent tracers. And they put the bugs on one mannequin and had it be examined and the next door had another mannequin. They re-examined them and found out what? They found out that the bugs were transferred from mannequin one to mannequin two by the stethoscope really well. That's the blue bars there. But if you look at the orange bars, that's after they cleaned the stethoscope. They still passed it from patient to patient. That fluorescent mar marker was 30% of the patient got it. So there's no randomized controlled trial of stethoscopes carrying bugs between patients. We have lots of case reports, but no randomized controlled trial. But there's plenty of studies that show that the stethoscope is a pretty effective vector for carrying bugs from one infected patient to the other. And we should be cleaning them between exposures. Challenges is how, how well do you clean them? I've already shown you that nobody cleans their stethoscope, but let's just say you did. You were able to, by yelling at the doctors long enough, they actually finally started cleaning their stethoscope. Well, this is what happens. You take that swab, you rub it on the alcohol, on the alcohol swab on the diaphragm for 30, 60 seconds. And what happens? Well, when you culture it before and after, that number 28 is back in the picture. 28% of them are still infected, even after 60 seconds of doing it right. So if you follow CDC guidelines, you're better than if you don't, but you still are going to have almost a third of your patients exposed to bugs, even if you're religiously cleaning your stethoscope. So that's the trouble, is that nobody does it. Even when they do it, it doesn't work very well. So this is what um, has been developed. This is a barrier that goes on your stethoscope, just like the gloves go on your hand. You can see the blue circle on that stethoscope. It is a thin uh, medical grade plastic that goes on the stethoscope diaphragm. It just prevents a barrier. It just gives you a barrier to prevent you from giving your patients disease. So the first question is, does it work? And this is a study that was published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings where we took a group of stethoscopes and we put urine and feces and sputum and saliva and infected blood and on a stethoscope. Uh, and then we randomized them to getting a barrier or not. And the stethoscopes with, uh, with the material on them are all infected. This is, we, we did specimens at 15 minutes and 30 minutes and hours and days and a week, up to a week later. And bugs grow on your stethoscope. You can see it right there. The interesting thing here is the blue boxes are all the bugs that grew on the stethoscope with the barrier, not one, zero. Uh, it provides a sterile barrier between the dirtiest stethoscope and the patient. So that's, that's the point here. I'm not suggesting that you put the barrier on and leave it there for a week. It's really meant to be used on a single patient and disposed. Um, but the idea is that it's a really effective uh, barrier from getting the patient infected. It even works with C. diff. C. diff is particular uh, in that we should call it out because even if you're uh, diligent with alcohol, alcohol didn't kill C. diff spores. So if you're following the guidelines, you're still spreading C. diff. Did the same study, bunch of stethoscopes, half got barriers, half, uh, the, we smeared C. diff on them, half got barriers, half didn't. And you can see here, the uh, light blue and the orange are the, are the stethoscopes without a barrier, they carry C. diff, stethoscopes with a barrier do not. So up to a week later, it's still sterile if you have a barrier uh, applied afterwards. This is an article that was published in the American Journal of Medicine. Uh, 
asking the questions of, is there a value for the stethoscope and COVID-19? And, and the answer is you have to hear if people can breathe or not. The ultrasound, all the fancy tools we have, don't tell you about the airway. It's critical that you use a stethoscope. They don't tell you about the presence of an S3 and if there's heart failure, it's critical we use the stethoscope. It can't go away. When you intubate somebody to know where the tube is, you need the stethoscope. Otherwise they're hypoxic and maybe die till you get it fixed. So uh, that, that's a challenge. The other article that's interesting here is a case report of a cardiologist who uh, was intubating a patient, had to get the stethoscope up, but out of their uh, protective gear, out of their PPE, uh, got it near their face, ha happened to inhale, uh, and then came down with COVID a few days later. Uh, and that was her only exposure. She's convinced that she got it from, uh, from that event. Uh, it's not great proof, but the idea that COVID be can, could be spread by a stethoscope is certainly not too far-fetched. Okay, so the next question is, well, we got this cool barrier. What if you put it on the stethoscope and it's a barrier to sound? Well, that would be absolutely useless and would not be helpful. So this is a study we did to evaluate the potential for the barrier uh, to be effective. And you can see uh, that box there that says discover on it. Um, that's how you get the barrier. You wave your stethoscope underneath it. There's a motion sensor, a sterile uh, barrier comes out. You press your stethoscope into that window. It sticks there. Uh, you listen to your patient, you throw it away. It's a disposable piece of plastic, it costs cents. And what we did is we put those on really high fidelity Lippmann 3200 stethoscopes and then had uh, essentially a tire residency class uh, go to the SimMan lab and we had them listen to simulation mannequins. And you can turn up or down the volume of the heart sounds and the belly sounds and the lung sounds. And so we did this till we had uh, uh, a group of people listening about 800 times. Uh, and half of the people got a barrier and half of them, half the physicians did not. And we looked at the probability of uh, a correct diagnosis with or without a barrier. And what we found is that in 400 with a barrier and 400 without, there was no difference. There wasn't a single misdiagnosis using a high quality stethoscope, whether it had a barrier or not. What became really interesting is we did a couple hundred observations where um, they either got a quality stethoscope with a barrier or they got the disposable stethoscope that we all use uh, with the idea that it's somehow protective of the patient getting disease. Um, I mean, you think about that, what better way of getting all your staff infected than having them share equipment, but that's what we do. And we had them listen to the patient with the disposable stethoscope or the quality stethoscope with a barrier. The disposable stethoscope misdiagnosis rate was 10.9%. It was zero with the good stethoscope. And then we looked at what were they missing and they tend to miss the, uh, the diastolic murmurs. They're the harder ones. And the problem with this is the diastolic murmur, the best predictor of heart failure is the presence of an S3. You can't hear it with a disposable stethoscope. So that means you don't make the diagnosis of heart failure until hours later. And there's a real clear a uh, huge amount of data that shows the longer you take to diagnose the heart failure, the longer, the higher the, the uh, mortality. So the number needed to harm here is, is uh, about 11. Can you imagine anything in medicine that you wouldn't have an 11 number to harm? Yeah, but that's it with the disposable stethoscope. It's time. These things need to go away. We have superior options. We should not be using the disposable stethoscope any longer. And then we asked the docs what they like, and they all love the uh, the high quality stethoscope with a barrier compared to the disposable. This is a study where they cultured the bedside stethoscope, the disposable stethoscope, and found about 5% had MRSA even after a clean. And even more than that, about 20% had pathogens on them before they were cleaning. So if you want your staff to get good and sick and share a lot of diseases, use it, have, force them to share equipment like a disposable stethoscope. This is the uh, box in action. You can see the physician make, waving underneath the, uh, the machine and then uh, putting their stethoscope uh, diaphragm on the bell, I mean, on the window and pulling off a sterile stethoscope. Uh, now your patient has a clean contact. Uh, it's, as I said, this is acoustically invisible. It will not, uh, you can't tell if it's on your stethoscope, quite honestly. Uh, it comes about 400 in a box and it slips into the dispenser. Uh, and so depending on the, at the rate of use, uh, you would have to replace that cassette periodically. And that's the dispenser itself. It's touch-free. The key is it's touch-free. If you have to touch the stethoscope uh, diaphragm uh, protector with your hands, you've now infected it. So it becomes self-defeating. So the advantage of here is you don't have to touch anything uh, that's going to contact your patient. We've also done a real-world assessment of the effect of the 
uh, implementation of the Discover system into uh, the clinical environment. And you can see the locations, those are the red dots, it's pretty much spread across the United States. And we asked people using this what they thought about it. Uh, these are all the actual centers, Bronx, Dayton, Ohio, uh, a group of centers in Texas, uh, University of California, San Diego, the Kipper Clinic and uh, hospital in, in Hawaii. And we ask them these questions. Uh, it takes you know a minute to fill them out after they've had experience with the Discover. Uh, ICU, telemetry, emergency medicine, urgent care, primary care, and a cancer clinic. And this is what we found out. If you, when we asked them, did they think this was easy to use? And it was a one to five ranking. Uh, the average score is 4.8 as very easy or easy. So basically uh, almost 100% thinks it's really easy to use. We asked if it's an improvement over disposable stethoscopes. And you can see there 41 and 11 think it's slightly improved or significantly improved. Asked what percentage of users thought they improved the impact on their workflow. And that is 95% thought it made it in better or it was no worse than what they're doing currently, which is not washing their stethoscope. Because if you had to wash it for fully six, 60 seconds as the CDC recommends, that definitely screws up your workflow. I, on a busy ER shift, I'll see 50 patients. If I have to wash my stethoscope before and after that's 100 minutes, it's almost two hours of stethoscope cleaning a day. That is not going to happen in my ER by anybody. We asked if they will, if the presence of the barrier would improve stethoscope hygiene, 95% say that it will, as you would expect. And the same number believe that it will improve patient safety because if you're not smearing bugs on patients, it's a benefit to the patient. This was recently published. It's a call to action to the CDC to upgrade the current guidelines. Now the current guidelines originally from 2008 uh, and then re-updated in 2018 say that you should wash your stethoscope uh, at least once a week if it appears to be dirty then more often because you can see viruses, right? Uh, of course not. Uh, so you have no idea if it's dirty. So, so, but the idea that you can wash it once a week is just absurd. Uh, since we know the same bugs are on the hands as the stethoscope. So what this group, it's a group of, uh, of uh, heart failure specialists, intensive care doctors, uh, infectious disease physicians, some emergency doctors, and all got around and together said they should uh, uh, recommend the CDC consider research, the research that's already been published on stethoscope hygiene. And what we should be doing in 2021 is having sterile contacts between every patient not once a week. Uh, they said that you should either wash it or put on the barrier. We know that washing is going to be tough. This was also a meeting that was recently held, the Stethoscope Contamination Clinical Expert Roundtable Forum, uh, a, a group of uh, hospitalists, emergency docs, intensive care docs, infectious disease docs um, came together uh, to help write these guidelines uh, that we need to update. So let me wind this up by apologizing to you. The next time your doctor comes to you with a stethoscope, you're gonna remember me and wonder, how many people has that touched since it washed? Did you see a COVID patient last a little while ago? Did you see anybody with AIDS a few minutes ago? And am I gonna get that rubbed on me? For the rest of your life, you're gonna remember me. Well, I'm sorry about that. Uh, let me summarize, stethoscopes are dirty, just like their hands, they're identical bugs. We've been doing what Ignaz Simoy said for 150 years, but we've been smearing bugs on patients with stethoscopes ever since then. We know that stethoscopes can transmit bugs between patients. And we also know that nobody cleans their stethoscope. But worse than that, even when it is clean, 28% still got bugs on them. So we need a better solution. Uh, the barriers protect uh, the patient. They protect the physician. Uh, for both you and your patients, you can have a stethoscope that works and doesn't spread disease among the staff. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. My email is there. I'd be happy to answer any questions um, and clean stethoscope listening.